When first starting out in CNC, the learning curve is steep. Today, I want to look back on five mistakes I made when I was just starting out three years ago, share them with you and some resources that can help you get started, saving you time and money. Hello, I'm Andy. Welcome to Andy Bird Builds. This channel is all about building, whether that's building a piece of furniture, building a woodworking business, or building confidence for your next DIY project. All right, let's get right into this list. Number one, and I think the most common mistake that people make when first getting into desktop CNC is running your spindle too fast. I know when I first started out, I was like, let's turn this thing all the way up. The faster, the better, right? Not necessarily. So my first CNC, the Shapeoko XXL, uses a palm router as the spindle. So setting six is roughly 28,000 RPMs. Setting one, I think is rated at like 12,000 RPMs. But when I was first starting out, I mean, I had to wear ear protection two stories up in my house um, when the CNC was running. And I didn't know any different because I had never been around a CNC. I had never seen anybody run a CNC router before. So faster the better. Now I cut primarily wood um, with my CNC. Wood is really forgiving. What you're going for is you wanna be making wood chips like this. And you don't wanna be making saw dust. If you're making chips and not dust, then you know your speeds are dialed in. Some signs that you're running your spindle speed too fast is you're burning your workpiece. You either need to increase your feed rate or you need to slow down your RPMs. Every machine is different. There's so many variables. Machines are different, spindles are different. And then the one I wanna talk about is tools are different. If you're running a V-bit like this one and you're running it at 28,000 RPMs, that is way too fast. In general, the larger the cutter, the slower the RPMs. So I found a great resource. It is Carbide3D's wiki page that has all kind, every material you can imagine and feed rates for all those materials. I'll link it down in the description. That is a great resource. And then you can tweak your rates once you get comfortable with those starting rates. All right, number two on this list is work holding. Now, there are a ton of options when it comes to work holding. I stumbled through all the different ones and not knowing what was gonna work in what scenario. And I spent a lot of time, but mostly a lot of money on clamping systems that I no longer use. So what I started out with three years ago were inline clamps. These work great and it, for the most part held the workpiece in place depending on what I was doing, but I broke several bits running them into the clamps because they stick above your workpiece. So that was something I didn't want to deal with. So I progressed to different, some different things and eventually I landed on for a piece of wood where I was cutting out a lot of small pieces. I actually screw it to my workpiece just with a screw right through the face of the wood and that way nothing's sticking above the surface for me to hit. Now for more delicate pieces where I need to save the face and I don't have the room to screw through, I'll use this double-sided tape. Now don't just use any double-sided tape. This particular double-sided carpet tape works very well so I will leave a link down in the description below for you to check that out. Number three, what do I make? I've got my machine, now what do I do? Now, if you're anything like me, I bought my machine with the intention of making money with it. What will sell? I don't wanna spend a lot of time on a product, developing a product, if no one's gonna buy it. So I think it's really easy to analyze it to the point where you become paralyzed. You don't know where to start, you don't know what to do. So my advice is just to start creating things that you are interested in. I've also created a step-by-step -step guide to help solve this exact problem. Now this guide will walk you through on how to create a product to sell using your CNC. It starts from the very basic to all the way bringing it to the market and where to sell it, how to sell it, pricing ideas, um, and there are a lot of pro tips along the way. You can get that guide by using the link in the description below. The fourth mistake I made that wasted a lot of time and a lot of money was my end mill selection. Again, just starting out with my desktop CNC, I didn't know what a V bit was. I didn't know what a down cut bit was. I didn't know where to use those or how to use those or what size. There are hundreds, probably if not thousands of different options out there when it comes to bits and end, mill, end mills. A V-bit comes in different angles, 
which basically translate to different amount of detail when it comes to sign making and making letters. That's typically where V bits are used. Now, quarter inch down cut, up cut bits are used for contour cuts a lot, which is to cut out the outside or to clear material. And a down cut bit does just that. It pushes the material as it's cutting it. It's ejecting the chips and pushing everything downward, which gives your top surface a clean finish. An up cut bit is doing the exact opposite. As it's cutting, it's ejecting those chips and pulling all the wood fibers upwards. So it gives you a clean bottom cut, but it'll leave you a frayed top surface depending on what material you're using, especially in soft woods. A combination up-down bit does both of those well. At the tip of the end mill, there is a down cut portion and the rest of it is an upcut portion. So like I said, I wasted a lot of money buying bits that I necessarily didn't need or don't use anymore. And I really reduce everything down to three different types of bits. It's the up or down cut bits, it's the V bit and bowl and tray bit. With those three bits, I can pretty much accomplish 99% of what I do. I'll also leave a link to those in the description for you to check out. It's a great starter pack where you're not, you know you're gonna use these three bits and you're not gonna waste a lot of money. Last but not least, number five, and that is setting up dust collection. I made the mistake of not setting up dust collection to my CNC for about the first year of use. It made an absolute mess in my shop and it was one of those things where I didn't think it was necessarily necessary. I didn't know the benefit, which was just naive on my part and I didn't prioritize it. So when I did get it hooked up, I was like, why didn't I do this sooner? So I know you've invested a lot of money into a desktop CNC or you're thinking about doing it, but don't overlook dust collection. And you don't have to go out and buy a big dust collector. You can buy a shop vac and use a shop vac that and hook it into the CNC and that'll work just as well. So my hope is that those five things highlight five mistakes that I made when starting out and they save you time and money. So be sure to check out all those links in the description for more information and use them as resources as you run up against these things. Be sure to check out all the CNC related videos I've made right here.